okay, I'm not telling you that Islam is the truth. Forget about it. I'm not telling you anything is the truth. I'm telling you the truth does exist out there. That's all I'm telling you. But what you need to do is ask your creator, if you believe that you have been created, ask him truly and sincerely, honestly for that truth. And I know for sure, sooner or later, he's going to guide you, you know. No human being, I don't care how atheist you are, you know, with pornography, with all that we witness now, uh, you know, consuming the whole world. Why are there so many divorces? There's very deep suffering, insidious suffering here. Uh, and people are getting very tired uh, with this suffering. So sooner or later, they're gonna look somewhere else for alternatives. It's like you owe some somebody something and after a while you come to that guy and say, well, forget about it, I don't owe you anything. That's, that's not very innocent. Above all those people, nobody would say, I owe my parents absolutely nothing. My mother, my father, you know, that would be not just rude, it would be inhumane. So what about your creator? Or did you create yourself? Or did you just emerge out of nothingness? No, if you observe you, any child, you talk to them and you say, oh, you know that there are people that say that everything you see, all, all this complex universe, nature, the sun, the moon, you know, all these sunrises, sunsets, beauty all around you, came from nothing, nobody created it. He will laugh, I, I tried this with kids. I tried it with my own daughter. And she was, she was like, what? <laughs> I swear to you, she said to me, she said, are there people that would say that really? For them, it's a religion of terrorists, a religion of misogyny, a religion against women, because they see that 70%, if not more, of the people coming to Islam are women. And Spain is no exception. Most people that enter Islam are women. People are asleep. When they die, they wake up. So for example, right now, Indonesia, we have, wow, it's, uh, it's late at night. Late at night. What comes from the heart reaches the heart, alhamdulillah. There's a lot of questions, there's a lot of misconceptions that everyone has from Muslims and from non-Muslims. So in this episode, we're gonna ask Brother Hisham and he's gonna try to answer us as best as his like ability, right? So starting off from the very first question, which is the most important question. Uh -huh. Why do we even have to speak about religion? Mm -hmm. Why do we even need religion? You know, there's a lot of people that are living their lives, they're happy, mm -hmm. they seem to enjoy their life, they're accomplishing a lot without them following any religion. Okay. So why do you have to speak about it from the first place? <clears throat> well, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. It's funny that you would start the conversation about Islam talking about the misconceptions and all this, these false ideas or topics that we, we see everywhere. Because uh, funny enough, Islam is one of the biggest religion on earth, if not the biggest, you know, but still is one of the most unknown religion or misunderstood religions uh, uh, in the world. So uh, we are very familiar with the things that are uh, supposedly wrong with Islam, but people seldom talk about the things that are right about Islam, the, the you know, the, the positive sides of Islam, if there are any negative ones, yeah? So, uh, fine, why religion? By the way, um, these terms that we are gonna handle in this conversation are English terms, and inevitably they were coined by Westerners. So religion comes fr from religio in Latin. Mm -hmm. It has its connotation, it has its uh, meaning, different meanings, yeah? Uh, in Arabic, we handle different terms, different uh, vocab. Uh, when we talk about Islam, we talk about deen, which is mm. different. You know, it's not the same religio as, or religion as deen. Deen comes from an idea. Deen is also connected to uh, dain. So a dain is uh, a debt. So in some sense, we are born with a debt already to our creator. You know, you are born with, uh, we call them in Spanish, red numbers, which means your, your account is negative, you know, uh, numbers. So uh, you owe something 
to who? To another human being? Yes, you owe a lot to your parents, to other people, yes. But above all those people, nobody would say, I owe my parents absolutely nothing. My mother, my father, you know? That would be not just rude, it would be inhumane, yeah? We wouldn't improve that. So what about your creator? Or did you create yourself? Or did you just emerge out of nothingness? No. If you observe your uh, disposition, uh, the, the function of your eyes, of your mind, of this, this combination of so many systems, the digestive system, the, the nervous system, the uh, uh, respiratory system, the cardiac, you, know, you have so many systems working all together and you say, oh, it was just an accident. You know, uh, everything happened just by chance. That's so, such a weird idea. If you think about it, nobody will, will accept it as true. It's just like, if I tell you, oh, by the way, um, I was walking uh, in the middle of nowhere in this desert and I found a Ferrari there, yeah? And I don't know how it happened. It just, uh, over the course of so many millennia and millions of years, the wind, you know, blew so, so, so hard there so fast. And also some rain from time to time, you know, and the, the engine was formed and, you know, these different parts, the wheels, etc. And all of a sudden, not just that, it, it, it started itself. It started uh, moving and it's a Ferrari. Well, my body is more complicated, more complex than any car, any engine ever invented by a human being. My brain is the most complicated artifact in the universe. In the universe. There's nothing as complicated as the human brain in the universe, anywhere you look. Yet there are people that say, well, it just happened by chance, you know, over the, the course. You know, there are no scientific uh, explanation of how life ar arose in, uh, on Earth. There's no absolutely scientific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we pass from, uh, you know, dirt to bacteria. How did it happen? There's no answer until today, hmm. even in evolutionary uh, terms. So the Dean comes from Dane, one of the the etymological, you know, roots of the, way, the word uh, Dean is this debt that I owe to creator. I was born, but you know, I was born through a lot of phases. You know, I, I didn't know anything when I was in the womb of my, of my mother. I, I didn't have any uh, physical capacity, any intellectual capacity, all these forces that Allah has put in me, the creator has uh, embedded in me you know, come from somebody. And then you are born and through your childhood, you have this innate inc inclination to recognize that it didn't come from no nowhere or nobody. Any child, you talk to them and you say, oh, you know that there are people that say that everything you see, all, all this complex universe, nature, the sun, the moon, you know, all these sunrises, sunsets, beauty all around you, came from nothing, nobody created it. He will laugh, I, I tried this with kids. I tried it with my own daughter. And she was, she was like, what? <laughs> I swear to you, she said to me when she was uh, younger, you know, six years old, seven years, I was having a casual conversation with her. She said, are there people that would say that really? You know, I said, yes, because as kids, we have this innocence, and it's the lack of that innocence that pushes us towards ingratitude mm -hmm. and uh, pushes us towards uh, denying the debt you owe to somebody. It's like you owe some, somebody something and after a while you come to that guy and say, well, forget about it, I don't owe you anything. That's, that's not very innocent, you know? And that's why any child, you talk to them and you say, oh, you know that there are people that say that everything you see, all, all this complex universe, nature, the sun, the moon, you know, all these sunrises, sunsets, beauty all around you came from nothing. Nobody created it. He will laugh. I, I tried this with kids. I tried it with my own daughter. And she was, she was like, what? <laughs> 
I swear to you, she said to me when she was uh, younger, you know, six years old, seven years, I was having a casual conversation with her. She said, are there people that would say that really? It's covered and we suffered this kind of uh, amnesia, yeah? So coming back to your question, why the need of her religion? First of all, the question is debatable because we don't use the same word, we use the deen. Religion is a, a very, uh, from the point of view of Westerners, or especially in, in Europe, maybe not so in, in the US uh, for historical reasons, but in Europe, religion has become a word connected with the church. And throughout the Middle Ages and later, etc., up until the 20th century, the church has not behaved in the best manner possible and didn't, absolutely didn't reflect the initial um, message of Jesus, which is uh, 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 the, the original message. Yeah. So when we come to the word Dean, we need it because we are in debt, because there is an undeniable hunger in the human being towards uh, the divine, towards the transcendental. The human being is a spiritual being. There's this uh, thinker that said there's a hole in the heart of a human being that nothing can, can fill except God. There's a hole, there's a void, there's a, a vacuum. And that vacuum, we have that in Islam, you know, Al-Qalbu Mahallu Nazarillah. The the heart is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses. Yeah? Allah doesn't look at your shape, your color, your body, uh, are you tall, are you uh, uh, short, are you rich, are you blonde, are you... That's superficial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on your heart and your actions. These are the words of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, he doesn't uh, uh, look at your um, shapes and bodies, he looks at your heart and your actions. That's the most important thing. So there is uh, and an undeniable inclination. Even genet genetists um, uh, the, the, or scientists that are, uh, you know, investigating genetics, sorry, um, they talk about the, the God gene. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on a, in our DNA to believe in, in, in God, you know? Now, the only thing that's up to you is whether you fill that void or just leave it unattended. It's whether you believe in the true God that really created you or you choose other things to believe in. You worship a mountain or you worship a tree or you worship a stone or, we, or you worship another human being. You worship creation instead of worshiping the creator. So that's the singularity of Islam. Now, the singularity of Islam is that it has complete monotheism, tawheed to the utmost um, level. And we start with almost an atheist uh, affirmation, which is la ilaha, there's no God except Allah, you know, illallah. There's absolutely nobody, nothing wor worthy of worship except the one who created uh, us. You know? So that's the singularity of Islam. And that's the part that so many people are kept from discovering, kept from discovering because there, there's an agenda worldwide to keep us from uh, looking into the core of Islam. We are so mesmerized by other things, you know, these dialogues about hijab, about, about politics, about, you know, so many different topics, but we don't talk about the core topics which are existential. Uh, topics that are the answers to the big questions that any human being at some point of his life, if not all the time, will have, which are who I am, who, who am I, what am I, where did I come from, where am I going, is it just uh, the atoms that uh, conform me, am I just the sum of the particles that that constitute my body. No human being, I don't care how atheist you are, I don't care how uh, an ideal, uh, ideologue of atheism you are, 
you will not accept that idea. Deep down in your, in your, hand, your heart, you're not accepting that idea. You might say it, but you're lying. In your mind, your heart, you're not thinking, I am just my particles, uh, particles of water, of you know this and that, and that's it. Any human being talks about something beyond the bodily, uh, call it con consciousness. Nowadays, they, they're using these euphemisms, you know? Instead of using the, the word soul, because it became a dirty, a dirty word, it's unscientific to talk about so but they came up with another word word which is uh, Conscious. consciousness define consciousness to me ask that any scienti uh, scientist and he's not going to be able to give you a very precise definition of what he means by consciousness because he means the same thing as soul and as muslims even the prophet sallallahu was asked about the soul you know it's alunak an ruh they ask you about the soul say the soul is a matter of my Lord, and you have not been given, except tiny fraction of knowledge. You don't have the knowledge to know what the soul is, you know? So uh, we have just covered these terms and these concepts by, by new words, new terminology, but we're still talking about the same questions that have occupied the human beings for millennia. And the human being has been a religious, yeah, between parentheses, a religious being up until the 20th century, 19th century. So 99% uh, of our history, you know, we have been people with consciousness towards uh, God. And now we have this anomaly, this not normal period of time in which the human being has rebelled and said, oh no, we're no longer gonna, gonna believe in God. Well, let's see where that is gonna lead us, you know. We can talk about where that has led us so far. You know? So you just said that <coughs> throughout history, people are religious. That's their nature. Absolutely. And believing, not believing in God or atheism is something that's new. Yes. I mean, like, how, how is it new? Why this never appeared before? But what led us to this point? Yes. Um, first of all, you know, when they study archaeology, they study, you know, uh, uh, ethnography of different peoples of the world, both living or ancient people that lived. You might have so many differences w when it came to their way of life, the food they ate, uh, when it came to the clothes they wore, uh, when it came to, to the utensils they used, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the things they find are very different, you know, uh, depending on when you, where you are, you know? Okay. But there's one thing that's constant everywhere, which is a religious uh, manifestation. You know, whether you are in, in a cave and you see those uh, paintings in a cave that have a very profound religious uh, uh, like uh, connotation to them, it's an offering to, to God or a recognition of the, the, the the favors of God, you know, all those animals were given to me, so I, I thank God for them, etc. That that kind of mentality is is there, but up until the nineteenth century, especially well, starting the eighteenth century with the French Revolution and all that, people tried to rebel against religion, and rightly so. I I do understand why. You know, I'm not I'm not saying it it shouldn't have happened or anything like that because given the context that it happened in, in which is Europe in the uh, 17th, 18th century, after so many religious wars in Europe, after so many uh, excesses by the, the church, excesses in the way uh, or in the sense that the church would uh, preach poverty to the to the people while the cardinals and the pope and the clergy etc lived in total wealth you know so that kind of um, hypocrisy drew people away from the church and from religion if you are against the church automatically in christianity you're against religion yeah so those paradigms and those uh, uh, models are not applicable to the islamic world we don't have a church we didn't have a clergy. We didn't have religious wars for uh, centuries that, you know, uh, the population of Europe 
was, sh uh, you know, sh shrunk to to probably half of of his uh, potential due to the hundred years war, the fifty years war. You know, these wars that were completely consuming Europe. So after the Treaty of Westphalia in, in Germany, they said, okay, Catholics and Protestants, we can live together and we need to put aside our religious differences and let's uh, go beyond religion a little bit. Plus, religion was seen as something against science. Why? Because every time a scientist came up with something, with a discovery, with an invention, etc., he was burned at the stake. He was burned. Uh, some of them accused of witchcraft, some of them accused of heresy, you know? We don't have that in the Islamic world. Science goes together with the deen, with religion, with the Quran, because the Quran started with Iqra, with read, investigate, research, you know? Tafakkur, uh, uh, you know, contemplate. The, the, the creation, it talks about the stars, it talks about the moon, the, the sun, the animals. You know, the, the animals are nations like, like you. We have chapters that are called the, the bee, you know, and we know the, the importance of bees that are, you know, uh, populations of bees are disappearing uh, uh, today. Uh, we have a chapter called the ant, you know, the ant being one of the most active insects when it comes to recycling. Huh? Why? Why do Allah subhanahu, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention these, these uh, creatures? To make us reflect upon the importance of every single component of this wide uh, creation. You will not find that in so many different uh, religious traditions. So there was a problem, you know, because uh, it's like a, a robe, you know, Europe was growing mentally, intellectually, and that robe, which is religion, was uh, getting smaller and tighter. So it broke inevitably. inevitably. Islam is, is different, it's flexible. Islam uh, is not there to, to, uh, to uh, shackle you, rather the, the contrary. One of the missions of the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the Quran, the, the, the shackles that were chaining you, the Prophet ﷺ came to put them aside or to break them. What kind of shackles? He's talking about the Jewish community, the Christian community, etc. And the Quran is talking about mental shackles, about shackles when, when it came to the interpretation of, of, uh, of jurisprudence, how it had became completely, uh, you tight. know, tight. Yeah. And Islam came to open the horizon for humanity. So I totally understand why Europe came to the conclusion that religion is not no good for us anymore. But that kind of conclusion is their conclusion in their context and their... Why, why project it to another civilization with another history? We don't come from where you come from. We have completely two different trajectories or paths that we have followed. So, you know, it's, what's good for you is, is not good for me, you know? So I do understand it, but I don't share it when it comes to Islam, you know? I share it when it comes to your uh, experience, but my experience is completely different, our ex collective experience as uh, Muslims is completely different. So now you have these, with all, uh, with all due respect, imbeciles saying that no, that Islam needs to put, put aside just like the Europeans did with Christianity. We need to do the same because it's going to halt our progress, etc. That's, that's nonsense. You, you're not putting everything in its place. And actually, some of the most conservative Muslim societies are the most advanced technologically, scientifically, etc. societies on earth, not just in the Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, world. So we need to have this clarity of vision when it comes to how history, you know, uh, um, happened in, in Europe and our history is completely different. Allah Alam, yeah. I, I like how you broke it down. So you spoke from the intellectual perspective. Yeah how it's like stupid to think that we don't need a religion. Basically. Because there's a debt that you have to pay. 
Mm-hmm. We didn't come from nothing. There's nothing mm-hmm. come, that comes from nothing. Right? Yeah. And then you also explained it from the spiritual perspective, how there's a void or there's a hole in everyone's heart that can never be filled only by God yeah. or by something else that you distract yourself. Absolutely. With, right? you, you take it a minor God, you know, that you, you know, mm. the, the Quran talks about it. A person can take himself as a God. Huh? <laughs> Have you seen the one that takes his own desires as a God? So today that's the, the situation we, we live in, 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 in the West, especially because uh, the divine has become the ego. So we have gone from an uh, idolatry to uh, egolatry. So we worship our ego. Mm. So now in Europe, whatever is pleasing to the body is good. Whatever is not pleasing to the body is completely bad. So it's just about amusement, about pleasure. And that has a name. It comes from uh, Greece. Nothing is new, you know. In Greece, they used to to talk about uh, hedonism. Hedonism is the worship of pleasure, you know? So that's, that's our predicament today. And that worship of pleasure started in Europe, the US, etc., and it has become the monoculture that has uh, invaded the whole world with the, what's called globalization. Now the whole world is you know, uh, going towards that kind of mentality, you know, even in the Muslim world, you have a lot of, uh, especially young people that are so mesmerized with that world, that kind of, you know, so we need to tell, tell that people, you know, you're being tricked here. You're being fooled. That's just taking yourself, your ego as the reference, as a, a central God in your life. Some people will take money as their God. You know, money is the maximum value. Some people take, you know, their own job as as their God. They worship their job, you know. So people are not aware that they're filling that void or filling that place that should be just for their creator with something completely different. And that's a new kind of idolatry. You put in false idols. You know, you're worshiping an idol. Maybe it's not a physical idol with a human shape or an animal shape, etc. You know, maybe we see that as a very primitive uh, side of the human being, etc. But, you know, you have invisible idols, you know, uh, a celebrity can be an idol. You know, now now we have we have these uh, programs called uh, called American Idol, Arab Idol, etc. And there's a lot of idolatry in that, you know. So we're taking celebrities as our idol. Whatever they say, we follow. Whatever trend they publicize on on their social media, if they cut their hair some some way, they you know they dress some some other way, etc. We follow blindly what they're doing, etc. Even if those people, maybe they're a good singer or actor or football player, but. He's a reference in football, not in philosophical and uh, ideological and theological areas of life. You know, he, he, he has no clue. He has no idea. So how are you following him in things that are decisive and vital when it comes to your relationship, not just with God, but with yourself, you know? And you find yourself miserable and you wonder why. You wonder why? Well, there's your answer. You're following the wrong, the wrong, the wrong example in life. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's, there's, uh, Subhanallah. There's, there's a friend of mine. I, yeah. I really could not believe this. <laughs> like, it happened to me, so I believe in it, right? So this guy, he used to drink, he yeah. used to gamble, right? Mm. And this is like two of the biggest addictions. And he was really deep into those addictions, right? Now he works here in Malaysia, and whatever that he gets from his job, he sends back to his ma- family. Yeah. Right, and he has been not able to send money back to his family because of those two addictions. Yeah, right? so he was totally, totally, like totally destroyed. 
yeah. totally depressed and everything. So I was speaking with him and everything, and we came to a conclusion, like a promise, okay, he will never do this again. He will never do this again. Like everything was serious, right? And then I saw in his phone, the wallpaper, whenever he opens his phone, yeah. is black pink. Yeah, yeah. One of the celebrities or something. Uh -huh. So I told him, okay, you're gonna stop gambling. You're gonna stop drinking. He said, yes, definitely. And he made the promise, wallahi, I'm gonna stop, right? Yeah. I told him, what about the wallpaper on your phone? You have to remove that. He said, no. Wow. I said, like, what do you mean? No, you have to remove that. Like, that's that's haram. Like, it's yeah. a distraction for you. Yeah. He said, see, I can stop gambling. I can stop drinking. But please don't talk to me about this. Oh, this please. I cannot remove. Yeah. So, I was like, yeah. You didn't expect that. You didn't <laughs> no, expect I was like, that. What? Like, are you, like, what is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, she's just a woman that you will never, ever meet. That's like dancing and singing. That has crazy. Yeah. But he still did that. Yeah. So as a person that, like, how long have you been living in Spain? So what? 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. So you live in those societies. Absolutely. Okay. So I want you to give us a picture of worshiping your ego, worshiping yourself, worshiping your desire. Yeah. What has it led to? Because from the outside, <laughs> we see that Europe is oh, developing, it's civilized, they're amazing, we want to be like yeah. them. Is that really the case? Well, it's really the case when it comes to material uh, aspects. Okay, Europe is to some degree thriving, not as much as before, you know, after the Second World War and all that, because Europe is declining in so many, in so many um, aspects. Yeah. But I'm going to give you one or two pieces of data. In Europe, and especially in Spain, I'm going to talk about the country I come from, yeah? What's the number one uh, medicine drug, yeah? Uh, sold at pharmacies. Panadol? Antidepressant. Oh. Antidepressants and drugs and, um, against anxiety to control anxiety, etc., are thriving, number one. They cannot keep up with the demand. Why? Because, to be honest, on the street, you see people that are going about their life, you know, shopping, going to work, going to university, etc. You see people that seem to be completely normal. People in their suit and tie, you know, women going about their, their life. It's like, oh, fine, yeah. But if you scratch the surface, you're going to find huge complexes and huge psychological problems going on and family problems, you know, family is declining, you know, or we can talk about so many different things that came from this original idea that I can do without God, you know, I'm, I'm now I'm, I can walk alone. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, people have no anchor. They're completely, uh, completely lost when it comes to a reference in their life. And, to be honest, what I'm sensing is that this trend is reaching its end. You know, sooner or later, people are going to be fed up with this, with this suffering. There's very deep suffering, insidious suffering here. Uh, and people are getting very tired uh, with this suffering. So sooner or later, they're going to look somewhere else for alternatives. And uh, because of this screen curtain, or this uh, uh, smoke curtain, sorry, the screen that has been created about Islam to prevent people from looking into Islam because it's for them, it's a religion of terrorists, a religion of misogyny, a religion against women, because they see that 70%, if not more, of the people coming to Islam are women. And Spain is no exception. Most people that enter Islam are women and they're very steadfast. In an age where Spain is very known for the massive million demonstration about uh, feminism and human, uh, uh, um, feminist rights, etc., that we understand where they come from because uh, Europe has lived a very, very bad uh, control by men over women. You know, we understand that Islam, Quran talks in a completely different way about women, about the uh, equality, uh, about, you know, uh, uh, between men and women. So people are getting, getting fed up with this nonsense and they're trying to find an alternative. Because of that smoke screen or curtain, they look last into Islam. That's the last mm -hmm. alternative, the last uh, religion they would investigate, yeah? 
And some people have told me this. They said, I've been a Buddhist, uh, of course, a Christian, uh, became a Jehovah Witness, then became, you know, an Adventist Christian. You know, they went from church to church, to church. Then they went into different religions like Shinto or something like that, went to Japan, went to... They said, I've never even given Islam a thought because, you know, the, oh no, Islam, are you serious? But then something happened, something clicked in their, clicked in their mind and started reading the Quran or reading a book about Islam, etc. And they found their way into Islam, subhanAllah. Because I think people are completely tired. When you talk to people and you, if you have good arguments and you show them the, the sad situation they live in and you sh show them that the, what they think is happiness is just, uh, I would say, uh, a placebo effect. Placebo effect. Mm. It's not the real medicine. Okay, wh wh what is happiness? Is working uh, five days a week and the weekend, you know, partying hard and, you know, drinking, etc., and having sex with people you, you're, you're not even, even going to remember. Is that, you know, that might work for one year, two years, five years. But after a while, they become sick. They don't want... Now there's a trend in Spain of... Uh, Spanish, non-Muslim, non-religious normally girls saying uh, or counting the months without having intercourse with, uh, with the other guys. You know, they, they don't know. Why? Because they are starting to see it as something that is destroying them in so many uh, ways, psychologically, spiritually, uh, you know. So this trend in Europe is receding. It's gonna it's gonna end sooner or later. Sadly, some Muslims are still you know thinking that that's the way to go. That way, you know the the, the intelligent thing is that if somebody went down a blind alley and he came back and he said, "There's no way out," we listen to them. Listen to them. Just find another way. Don't go all the way down. No, no, no. Let me go and or he says there are some thieves there that are gonna rob you. You know, so listen to them and, you know, play it safe. No, no, no. We, the Prophet Sallallahu says it. You know, he said it. He said, Hatta law dakhalu juhra dabbin la dakhaltum. Even if they enter the hole where, you know, this uh, kind of, uh, how do you call it? Reptile, you know, mm. is lurking de there to, to, to bite you. You're going to enter the hole and find out for yourself. Okay, we be my guest. So I think uh, in Spain and Europe, in general, the West, people are coming to the, to the conclusion that, okay, there was a trend after uh, World War I, II, etc., that brought people to this materialistic cons uh, consumerism, etc. But now we're going through minimalism, for example. We're going to uh, towards now in Spain, for example, people there there are trends of, uh, among people that abstain from buying new clothes. They go to secondhand shops, you know, because they say, "Oh, I don't want to participate in this consumerism worldwide." Now you have all these trends that go towards, for example, intermittent fasting. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, meditation. Yeah, let's do meditation because that's how I focus, I find my peace, etc. All that you have in Islam, you know, it, it, it has been brought to you, you know, courtesy of Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago. You just didn't listen. Now you're finding out that that works. That so, you know, it's uh, it's, it's gonna end up end up showing sooner or later, you know, subhanAllah. Hmm. It's like, like people are following the sin of the Prophet without knowing without that they knowing. are following Yeah, Wallah, <laughs> subhanAllah. Yes. And when you talk about, uh, about these kind of issues with them, you know, we do not talk to people about these issues and these uh, problems, etc., in order to just criticize or to be mean to people. That's the last thing on my, on my mind right now. Wallah. Those people, be it Muslim or non-Muslim, are my brethren at the end of the day. They are my 
brothers and sisters in humanity. And we share the same uh, destiny. We're in this together. We're on the same ship. Literally, the Prophet ﷺ talked about a ship, you know, the hadith of the Safina, the ship, you know, the two people, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, some went to the bottom deck and some stayed on, on top. You know, the yeah, famous can, hadith. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, well, the Prophet ﷺ said that there are two groups of people that went on the ship and they, you know, started their journey. Some of them went to the, you know, bottom floor, floor of the or deck, you know, of the of the ship and some stayed on, on top of the ship, yeah. Um, and the ones in the bottom, they said, okay, in order not to bother the ones above us, uh, in order to be able to perform our wudu, to wash our, ourselves, we're going to put a hole here and the water that comes in, we're going to use for all this. The Prophet Sallallahu says that the people on top, if they allow them to do that in order not to bother them, then both of them are gonna sink, both of them are gonna end up dead. So they have to intervene and stop them from uh, putting a hole on that ship because they're on that ship together and they have a responsibility, you know, when it comes to those people. It's not, it's not nefsi nefsi, just my own salvation. You know, salvation is a collective thing. It's not an individual thing, you know? So, when we talk about these issues with people, we talk out of, especially, uh, a, a sense of rahmah, of, uh, of mercy, which is the value on which Islam is built. The Prophet Sallallahu the message of Islam, the message of the Quran, the whole of this revelation is reduced by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala speaking to the Prophet, reduced to one word, which is Rahmah, which is mercy. We have not sent you except as a mercy to the creation. It's not to mankind. Some people translate it as Al-Alameen, as mankind. Al-Alameen doesn't mean mankind. Al-Alameen means creation. It means everything, to, a mercy to the worlds in plural. Because Al-Alameen is everything uh, um, except the creator. Mm. Creator, you have the creator and the creation. So Al-Alamin is everything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's that's the, the 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 intention that moves us to talk about this these issues uh, and to try to show people that there is a lot behind this message about this book, the Quran. You know, it's not it's not as as um easy and as uh trivial as you think it is, you know, you need to give it some thought, some time, some reflection, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, are they not able to contemplate, to reflect upon the Quran or are their hearts sealed, you know, with, you know, with, with the lock? Huh? So that's, we, we need to start tapping on those hearts and start unlocking those hearts in order to see the beauty and the, the effectiveness, not just the beauty, it's not just a, a theore theoretical beauty or anything like that. It's something effective, it's shifa, it's a medicine for all your sickness, for your personal, psychological, uh, individual sickness, your collective sickness, for your uh, health, for your uh, economy, for everything that the, human beings suffering from today will have its answer in the final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. So I know you've been in the field of da'wah <coughs> for many, many years. Right? Yeah. So can you share with us some stories that you came across that amazed you, stories that you will never ever forget? Oh, absolutely. Uh, my effort of da'wah is in Spanish. Uh, basically, my English is so rusty and I apologize for, for it, but my, my dawah is uh, almost 100% in Spanish. Um, I do dawah in Arabic as well, but especially in Spanish. And throughout these years, you have come across, I have come across a lot of profiles of people that came to Islam. Uh, you know, each one of them for so many different reasons. Um, an example that comes to mind right now 
is this American brother that came from, he lives in Saudi Arabia right now, but he comes from Philadelphia. This guy was in this mission in the Pacific Ocean on a ship studying whales. Yeah? I'm talking about the 70s. Okay. Yeah, he converted, he entered Islam in the early 70s. He was there, early 70s, Islam is completely unknown in, in the US, you know, very unknown religion. And the people that knew about Islam, they knew about something called Nation of Islam, which is a fringe sect, you know, or cult uh, group in, in, in the US. So this guy's in, in the middle of nowhere, close to the North Pole. And he's going through this existential, yeah, because look, people are kept from these questions, etc., cetera, because, because they are too, they are too distracted. Entertainment, etc., is like anesthesia. You know, they, they give us a shot of anesthesia so you don't feel anything anymore. You're numb. You know, all your intellectual aspirations, your psychological ills, etc., they uh, are not felt by the individual. So all this YouTube, Netflix, uh, uh, TikTok, TikTok etc., is just to numb you. When does it wear off when you are left for a long period of time on your own without that kind of entertainment and that kind of... Uh, you know, uh, distraction, and you start a conversation with yourself. You start talking to yourself. That's why silence, I would say, is sacred. Silence, you know, al uh, being isolated for, for a period of time on your own with your thoughts, you know, reflecting, uh, contemplation, you know, a sunrise, a sunset. Every single happening in the universe is a message. Ayah is a sign to the human being. Just, we don't, we don't read between the lines. So this guy's in, in the middle of the ocean, looking for whales to study, etc. up north, close to the North Pole. And he starts, to, you know, looking into, and he's reading, I, I can't remember this book about Buddhism, about, uh, you know, um, yeah, this, this very, uh, very um, famous book about Buddhism. And on board of that ship, there was a Native American. They came to him and said, why are you looking into Buddhism? And you haven't read the books by Malcolm X? He said, who's Malcolm X? He said, I can't believe you're an African American in the 70s, you, you don't know Malcolm X. So he gives him a book by Malcolm X. He started reading that book. He goes back to the US after a while. First thing, when he reached uh, San Francisco, uh, the first thing he wanted to do is find a place where they can teach him about Islam. So he wanders around uh, the, the streets of San Francisco and he stops a bus. And he asks the bus to take him to the, to, uh, the nearest mosque or something like that. And the bus, driver said, well, there are no mosques, but you can go to uh, a jazz club because a lot of the jazz players were Muslims. He goes to a jazz club and he met some Muslim there and he takes him to a mosque, etc. And now, um, two years ago, I met that guy. I, I had met him 10 years ago in a TV program. I made uh, an interview. And then I went to Medina and we met there and I introduced him to a group of people. We were a hundred people from Spain. And I brought him to this uh, orchard of, of palm trees. And we sat there and he told us his story. The people were completely uh, absorbed by the story because there are so many different so-called coincidences or, you know, that took place in order to conduct that guy exactly to where he is right now, subhanAllah. So every single human being has a different story, a different path to uh, Islam. Uh, in the age of the Prophet Sallallahu one of the most unbelievable stories is the story of Salman al-Farisi. Salman, the Persian, uh, 
how he came to Islam and how he was a prince in Persia. And he left that because he was no longer convinced with the, um, you know, the Zoroastrian uh, religion. And he went and became a Christian or a follower of one of the, uh, one of the, uh, you know, one of the teachers of Christianity back then. And when he died, he sent him to Medina. He said, I know uh, based on the scriptures that the last prophet is going to, uh, appear in such and such place in, in Arabia, because it's in Isaiah. You know, if you go to, um, the book of Isaiah and the Bible, you will find the Oracle against Arabia. It's, it's, it's t entitled like this. The title is the Oracle against Arabia. And it tells the people of Medina of Tayma and Medina. Yeah. yeah it, it talks about places by name that they should go out in order to uh, accommodate this refugee who's going to come from Mecca, from the land of uh, uh, Qaidar. Qaidar is one of the descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. Okay, uh, so it, it talks about how the people of Medina are going to receive the Prophet sallam, etc. So he went there, he was captured on the way, enslaved, and he lived as a slave. After being a prince, he lived as a slave in Medina. Okay. Until the Prophet ﷺ came. And the teacher in uh, Christianity, he told him how to test the Prophet with three things in order to know whether he's the, the right guy or not, the, the true Prophet or not. And he did that, and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was beyond any doubt the Prophet he was sent to meet. So, subhanAllah, you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings you in different ways to uh, to the shahada, to enter in Islam, subhanAllah. So throughout the years, hundreds and hundreds of people have told me their story and every story is different in some way. Every story has different uh, components, different, you know, subhanAllah, in interventions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to bring you to, to Islam. And that I think is because once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees sincerity in your heart, you are sincerely seeking the truth. It's impossible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to guide you to the truth. But you need one prerequisite, one condition, sincerity. Okay, I'm not telling you that Islam is the truth. Forget about it. I'm not telling you anything is the truth. I'm telling you the truth does exist out there. That's all I'm telling you. But what you need to do is ask your creator, if you believe that you have been created, ask him truly and sincerely, honestly, for that truth. And I know for sure, sooner or later, he's going to guide you, you know, because it's impossible that he has created you and he's not, he's, he's going to leave you on your, on your own, not guide you to, to the truth. Yeah.